Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're on day, what, three? The Boy Who Dared. Um, all right, here we go. School is dismissed, and Helmet runs outside. He looks for Gearhart and Hans, but he doesn't see them. The wind is biting cold and blowing from his, the north. It sweeps across the Elbe River and across Hamburg's channels and lakes. Helmet pulls his black woolen cap over his ears. The Hammerbrook streets teem with excitement. Stormtroopers wearing swastika armbands and tall, shiny jackboots shout, Deutsches Volk, Erwand, dem Nationalisms, Gerhard Deisunkuft. The German people awaken. The National Socialists are the future. On the corner, several stormtroopers, or the SA, as the members of Hitler's private army are called, are passing out white leaflets that announce a victory parade through downtown Hamburg that night. Do you know who Hitler is? A stormtrooper asks Helmut. The leader of the National Socialist Party, says Helmut, and now he's our chancellor. Smart boy, says the stormtrooper. He hands Helmut a leaflet. Come to the parade. Watch Germany awaken. Germany needs soldiers like you to fight for the fatherland. Soldiers like you, the praise squares Helmut's shoulders and he beams at the stormtrooper. He snatches a leaflet, folds it, and slides it into his pocket. All around, it is snowing leaflets. The wind flutters them over the cobblestones like snow. The streets and sidewalks lie littered with white paper. The air is charged with excitement. Helmut feels electric with excitement too. Someday, he will fight for the fatherland. He can feel it, knows in his heart that it is true. The hallway outside, his flat smells sweet, like sausage and fried onions. Helmet drops his leather satchel near the door. In the kitchen, Moody stands at the stove and tends a large black skillet. She has dark circles under her eyes from not enough sleep. Moody never sleeps enough. She is always tired. Tired from working nights at the nursing home. Tired from the elderly people and their demands. Tired from scrubbing the nursing home floors, changing the patient's bed, and raising three boys alone. The boys need a father. That's what Oma says. About that, Moody never argues with her mother. She just says she's doing her best. But Helmut knows Moody is tired of Oma's advice, too. Moody divorced Hans and Gerhardt's father long ago, and she never, or she never married Helmut's father. She doesn't like talking about that man, not one bit. Helmut clutches the leaflet as he watches Moody brown the sausages and onions. Have you heard, he asks, about Hitler? Moody smiles and taps the wooden spoon against the frying pan rim, then rests it on the counter. Helmut senses that he is her favorite, though she would never say so. He senses that Gerhard and Hans know it too. How can I not hear, says Moody, with all the shouting and marching? Who can sleep with all the excitement? We're celebrating with sausage and onions and sauerkraut. No more soup. Before you know it, we'll eat veal and potato dumplings and plum kuchen every day. Plum cake. It's Helmet's favorite. He takes his mother's good mood as a sign. He shores up his courage and shows her the leaflet. Bitty Mooty. May I please go? Muli barely glances at the leaflet. Doesn't even think it over. Ach, nay, she says firmly. You're too young. What if Hans and Gilhard take me? His mother hesitates. Helmut uses her hesitation to dig in a toehold. I'll stay by them. They'll watch me. I'll be careful. We'll be careful together. Helmut feels her giving in, but Moody shakes her head, her dark brown hair billowing around her pity pretty face, her pale, tired face, and says, Nein, it's verboten. I forbid you to go. You're not old enough. If something happened to you, I'd never forgive myself. Helmet crumples the leaflet, shoves it into his pocket. Darkness spreads through him. It isn't fair. You let Hans and Gerhard go. Never mind about your brothers. They're older. Helmet scuffs at the floor with the toe of his shoe. His classmates will talk about the parade tomorrow. They will boast how their fathers took them. If only Helmet had a father, things would be different. A father would let him go. A father would take Helmet himself. After supper, Moody hums as she dresses for her job at the nursing home. Helmet turns on Moody's old radio. It's a small luxury to have a radio. Each month, Moody pays a tax to the Reichprost and makes Oma click her tongue in disapproval but the radio makes Moody happy. 
Helmut twists the dial and finds the Reich station, the RRG, who turns up the volume to tune out Moody. Over the radio, the RRG blares reports that the parade to celebrate Hitler's victory is underway. Thousands of flag-waving revelers are lining Germany's streets. Helmut glances at the clock. It's nearly seven. Hans and Gerhard are still not home. Helmut can barely stand it. He feels certain that Moody has allowed them to ride the train into the city center. He's convinced that they are jostling and pushing for a place on the sidewalk outside City Hall. And later, when they return home, they will rub it in. Rub it in that they are old enough to participate in the celebration, and he is not. Moody kisses the top of Helmut's head. Your brothers will be home soon. Oma will come over to tuck you in, she says, as she slips into her old brown woolen coat. It's so worn, the edges are frayed, and so huge it swallows her up. So tiny she is. At the door, she trills her fingers goodbye. She feels bad. Helmet can tell. Good. She should feel bad. He doesn't wave back. Sits sullenly at the table. He's eight, old enough to put himself to bed. Helmet turns up the volume on the radio and the sounds of the parade fill the flat. He rests his chin on his hand and closes his eyes. He imagines the sidewalks jammed with revelers sporting swastika armbands and raving red, red, white, and black flags. He hears the brass bands too, and in the living room, gleams bright with snow, f- showy flutes and trumpets and trombones. He imagines the streets booming with Nazi stormtroopers, hundreds of them like distant thunder, marching straight-legged, twelve abreast, singing in echoing voices. We have broken the bonds of servitude. I don't know how the song would go. For us it was a great victory. We shall march on and on, even if all is destroyed. For today Germany shall hear us, and tomorrow the entire world. That's, that would be scary. Beneath the singing, Helmut feels the drums. They stir his blood, call him to duty makes his legs long to leap away from the table, away from the radio, and run down to the inner city to join the marchers. The flat door cracks open. It's Oma, wearing her housecoat and slippers, come to shoo Helmet to bed. Your mother spoils you, letting you stay up this late, Oma says, clucking her disapproval. But she leaves the radio on. Helmet crawls between the bed covers, shivers. It's cold without Gerhard and Hans to warm the bed. He thinks about the stormtrooper earlier that day, how he said Germany needs soldiers, soldiers like him, and he feels a deep love for all things German. Helmut tries to stay awake, but somehow he falls asleep. By morning, the radio is quiet, and there lie Gerhard and Hans, fast asleep, anchored on either side of him. Two nights later, Helmut lies belly down on the living room floor, listening to Hitler's first speech over the radio. Hitler speaks plainly in words easy to understand. Helmut likes the sound of Hitler's voice, the way his rasping, barking, voice pulses with energy. It charges Helmut up, makes his own heart beat with fear as Hitler warns that communism could destroy the fatherland. It seeks to poison and disrupt in order to hurl us into an epoch of chaos, shouts Hitler, beginning with the family. Communists have undermined the very foundations of morality and faith and scoff at the culture and business nation of the fatherland justice and honor. As their new chancellor, Hitler promises to protect Germany from communists. He also promises to restore greatness to Germany, and he calls upon the German people to join him. Every class and every individual must help us create the new Reich, Hitler implores. The national government will preserve and defend those basic principles on which our country has been built. It regards Christianity as the foundation of the national morality and the family as the basis of national life. Nation, Christianity, morality, family. Helmut knows these things are very important. The speech isn't very long, and at its end, Hitler prays, May God Almighty give our work His blessing, strengthen our purpose, and endow us with wisdom and the trust of our people, for we are fighting not for ourselves, but for Germany. See, says Moody to Opa, Hitler wants what's best for us. Opa disagrees. He wins the kingdom by flattery, just as the Bible warns us, he says, clicking off the radio. But like it or not, Hitler's our chancellor now. Flash forward. And so the morning of day number 264 begins like every other morning on death row. Helmet uses the slop bucket again, 
a handful of cut-up newspapers, squares in his hand. He picks out the ones with Hitler's name and uses those to scrape himself. Yeah. All right, flashback. It's the end of February. Helmet stirs awake as Moody pulls the bed cover, smooths him, and bends over him, kisses his forehead. Moody, he murmurs, I was dreaming about a sparrow. He doesn't want to open his eyes, doesn't want the dreamy, flying feeling to go away. The bed sinks as Moody sits beside him. God watches over sparrows, she says softly. The sparrow guides the soul to heaven. Her voice cracks a little, the way it does when she's anxious or troubled. Now go to sleep, she says. Moody stands. She closes the bedroom door behind her, but Helmet is wide awake now. He slips from the bed, finds Moody sitting in the dark, listening to the radio, her hand over her mouth. The radio dial glows amber. Moody, what's happened? Is it bad? She hushes him, pulls him onto her lap. The Reichstag is on fire, blares the radio newscaster, burning out of the control. This is shocking news. The Reichstag is the parliament building, the seat of the government in Berlin, and now it's on fire. Adolf Hitler has pronounced the raging fire a communist plot, cries the newscaster, a plot to take over the German government. Germans must remain on ready alert. Helmut's eyes open wide. Are we in danger? Not us, says Moody, pulling Helmut close. We're safe. They've already arrested the culprit. How do we know it's the right person, asks Helmut. They said so on the radio, says Moody. Hitler will protect us from communists. She ga grasps his shoulders, steers him towards his bedroom. Now go to bed. Helmut crawls between Gerhard and Hans, who are both sound asleep. The windows are closed against the cold, but Helmut can hear the steady wail of a police siren. The police must be off to arrest the communists. Helmut assures himself, that's good. Jail is a good place for people who want to destroy the government. All right, we're going to stop right there. I'll get those questions out to you and see you later.